Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Charles Adele, Senior Advisor in the Australia Chair here at CSIS. I'm really pleased to welcome everyone here in this room and all the hundreds, if not thousands, of you who are watching uh, online. I'm particularly uh, excited to welcome our distinguished guests who have come for this really important conversation on both the military and the strategic implications of AUKUS. Uh, collaboration between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, AUKUS aims to boost the defense capabilities, enhance technological integration, and expand the industrial capacity of all three of our nations. First announced in September 2021, AUKUS is comprised of two distinct pillars. Pillar one is a trilateral effort to support Australia's acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. Pillar two is a focus on expanding advanced technology that our three nations will use together, including uh, cyber capabilities, hypersonics and counter-hypersonics, uh, quantum, artificial intelligence, uh, other undersea uh, capabilities, and a range of other capabilities. AUKUS, as you can tell, is an extraordinarily ambitious program, and we're just beginning to under the, understand the scale of those ambitions. This means investments into our own and our allies' systems, a real linking of Asian and European allies, and integration to a large degree of our industrial capabilities. Uh, the ambitions have grown of this undertaking commensurate with the scale of the challenge uh, that we are all presented with. AUKUS was undertaken against the backdrop of a deteriorating security environment in the Indo-Pacific region, specifically centering around the explosive growth of China's military capabilities and the increasingly aggressive use to which those military capabilities are put. Those two trends have heightened security concerns in the region and motivated AUKUS members to begin aligning their strategies and respond to the challenges posed by Beijing. So when you look at AUKUS, please remember that it has more than one objective. It's meant to transform the industrial shipbuilding capacity of all three nations. It's meant as a technological accelerator. It's meant to reestablish what Penny Wong has called strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific region, and ultimately, it's meant to be a model for how the United States works with and empowers its closest allies. But if AUKUS's ambitions are expansive, so too are the challenges that it faces, including its long-term political support and financial resourcing, the ability to scale up submarine production, uh, the necess necessity of finding the skilled workers who are going to be building those submarines, uh, the challenges of reforming our regulatory system and the way that we control our most sensitive technology, and of course the overriding imperative of providing deterrence now and not in 10 years' time. Now to discuss AUKUS and its strategic and military significance, I'm extraordinarily honored uh, to be here today with two of its extraordinary driving forces, Admiral Michael Gilday, uh, CNO, and Dr. Kurt Campbell. Uh, Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator of Indo-Pacific Affairs at the White House. I don't think I need to introduce them, but I will introduce them just so that everyone knows exactly who we're dealing with here. Admiral Gilday is the son of a Navy sailor and the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations. A surface warfare officer, he is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and holds master's degrees from Harvard Kennedy School as well as the National War College. At sea, he has deployed uh, aboard the USS Chandler and Princeton and Gettysburg and has commanded the USS Higgins and Benfold, Destroyer Squadron 7, Carrier Strike Group 8, and US, US Fleet Command, uh, sorry, US Fleet Cyber Command. As a flag officer, he has served in joint positions as director of NATO's Joint Force Command Lisbon, as chief of staff for the Naval Striking Group and Support Forces NATO, director of operations for both US Cyber Command and Joint Staff, and he has recently served as Director of Joint Staff and began serving as the 32nd CNO on August 22, 2019. Dr. Kurt Campbell serves as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs on the National Security Council. 
who was previously chairman and chief executive officer of the Asia Group. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. Campbell served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. He was formerly CEO and the co-founder of the Center for New American Security. He is the author or editor of 10 different books and received his BA from UC San Diego and his doctorate in international relations from Oxford University. I'm extraordinarily humbled uh, that you've chosen to have this conversation with us. I'd like to invite both of you up to stage so we can get on with the conversation. Thank you. my mic on. I hope it's just one, so it, I did not know this, but we both have served on, on board the same ship. Oh, so I was, right. on the, I was on the Princeton as well, so we'll have to, we'll compare notes after this, so thank you. In fact, that's going to be the entirety of our conversation today. Um, I'd actually like to start uh, with a very basic, but perhaps expansive question for Admiral Gilday. Uh, from a military perspective, what is AUKUS intended to accomplish? Well, um, in your eloquent remarks, you mentioned this destabilizing environment in the Indo-Pacific in a region that is so critical uh, uh, for global prosperity. And so I think AUKUS is among a number of initiatives uh, that the United States is undertaking with its allies and partners in order to provide more stability in the region, more predictability in the region. Um, and I think the, the s stability piece is very important. Um, there's also a deterrence aspect to this uh, against any malign behavior that I think is, is key. Um, in terms of our navies working together, the US, uh, the UK, and Australia, some would say it's a natural next step for us. We've been working together uh, for 100 years now, over 100 years, and so this would be a, uh, an obvious evolution in terms of where we would go, not only in terms of interoperability, but uh, AUKUS takes it to a new level in terms of interchangeability, uh, particularly with uh, SSN AUKUS, which will be a hull common to two of the three nations with components, many of the components that are common uh, to U.S. submarines. And so that's a, a great leveler for all of us in terms of interchangeability. I also um, uh, just would foot stomp the points that you made on uh, technical interoperability as well. And the technical exchange uh, and I think um, uh, uh, interoperability, or that's probably not the right word, but uh, uh, the partnership uh, that we gain in industry is going to be key here in terms of knocking down barriers with respect to uh, the uh, transfer of technology and information. And I think that uh, in areas like quantum and AI, um, uh, unmanned, uh, the possibilities are really limitless here. And we would be self-limiting if we didn't take great advantage of the opportunities that AUKUS will present in that, in that regard. Perfect. If we uh, start from the military objectives, kind of increasing our uh, interoperability, interchangeability, as you've said, as we hear in Australia uh, a lot too, when we broaden out a little bit, uh, Kurt, thinking about the strategic uh, objectives of this, uh, we should note that AUKUS is not the only thing that we're doing in the region. And I'm curious, uh, from your vantage point at the White House, how AUKUS sits within some of the other efforts that we're undertaking as we try to build uh, something that creates more strategic equilibrium. Uh, thanks, Charles. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for holding uh, this session today. I think it's important for there to be a greater uh, understanding of what we're trying to accomplish um, collectively in the Indo-Pacific. And I also want to pay my respects to the Admiral to the role he's played in, in everything um, that the United States is under, undertaking both at sea and also the Indo-Pacific region more generally. <clears throat> I would say if you, if you look at a range of efforts, both in just unilateral, bilateral, multilateral, you see the evolution of a strategy that places the Indo-Pacific squarely at the center of uh, future uh, uh, endeavor. And you've heard me say before, Charles, that that involves, first of all, trying to just erect a bipartisan agreement about how we will conduct ourselves 
in the, in the Indo-Pacific, investing in the necessary capabilities in uh, the United States more generally uh, with the recognition that technology will be at the core of arenas of competition going forward. And then a series of actions uh, uh, with respect to bilateral and multilateral engagements. And I'll just run through some. We're going to talk today largely about uh, AUKUS, but there's the Quad. There are trilateral engagements that we've undertaken in Northeast Asia. Um, we've sought to build on um, closer ties with Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines. You will have seen last week, I think, a pretty substantial um, uh, diplomatic um, initiative to open a much closer period of, of uh, strategic uh, orientation and partnership between the United States and India. This is all about basically sending a signal of our determination, Charles, to not only maintain peace and stability, but to stabilize, protect, and secure the operating system of the Indo-Pacific, which has basically propelled historic levels of growth, lifted people out of poverty, provided for a larger sense of well-being in the Indo-Pacific and something worth very much preserving uh, as we go forward. And we'd also argue that some of those uh, uh, benefits have uh, very much affected China as well. So we think this, what we are doing fundamentally is in the larger interest of the maintenance of that peace and stability that has largely prevailed in the Indo-Pacific. I would say the other elements of AUKUS uh, that are important are that, that we are increasingly linking efforts in Europe uh, to our uh, endeavor in the Indo-Pacific. As the Admiral indicates, um, we have a extraordinarily strong partnership between the U.S. and the Royal Navy that has you know, flourished over 70 years. We've never taken a step like this before. We decided largely because of the unique quality and the close partnership of our relationship uh, with Australia to take this step and to link not only Great Britain and the United States with Australia, but basically to link the theaters in more substantial way, a process that has in many respects been accelerated through the tragic conflict in the Ukraine. So I think what AUKUS is, is part of a larger determination uh, of the United States to act in decisive, innovative ways to signal that we're going to play a powerful, important, and enduring role in the Indo-Pacific now and into the future. And, and I do also want to just underscore that, that I, I do believe that each of the countries went into this um, with their eyes wide open, understanding the challenges, understanding that this is not just a week or two of celebration, but they're all, we're all in it for the challenges ahead. And this is not something that will be accomplished in a short period of time. This is a long term partnership that I think we're all up for. Thank you. Uh, I, I feel quite lucky that we can take both the military and strategic perspectives at once. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we've talked about stability and trying to inject more stability into the region, as we've talked about China, it's not a secret to say that Beijing has responded adversely across the board to the announcement of AUKUS. And yet AUKUS is not intended uh, to provoke China. In fact, when uh, President Biden was out in San Diego, I'm going to read this. He said, AUKUS has one overriding objective, to enhance stability in the Indo-Pacific amid rapidly shifting global dynamics. And I'd like to get a little bit more granular and ask uh, how you see it doing that. Uh, how does building up U.S. and allied capabilities uh, enhance stability, and how does it contribute to deterrence? Admiral, if you'd like to start. I think that we've been, I think the administration has been very transparent in terms of the path that we're on to executing AUKUS, in terms of both planning and execution, um, uh, with not only um, uh, Americans, but also more broadly people around the globe. And so it's a phased approach that's been uh, very transparent in terms of 
are uh, beginning to conduct more port visits uh, with the Australians and a phased approach to uh, then begin uh, forward deploying our submarines, perhaps up to four uh, out of uh, HMS Sterling near Perth, uh, to co-crew those submarines with Australians in a very deliberate uh, manner. Uh, and then uh, finally get us to a point where Australia is sovereign ready and, and can then take custody of the sale of U.S. submarines and then eventually produce our own. All the while, we are working hand in glove with them in the U.K. in terms of creating the ecosystem that's so important to maintaining a nuclear force. As you know, we've had one in the United States uh, since the 1950s. And there is a culture there um, that doesn't take any shortcuts, uh, that is self-assessing and self-correcting. That culture becomes very, very important. And it isn't something that just appears overnight that has to be ingrained in a cadre of sailors that um, are passionate about what they do and serious about what they do. So I think that there are many layers and elements to this that we've been sharing. As Dr. Campbell said, uh, that 18 month consultative period, we have been wide open in terms of the challenges yeah. uh, from an industrial standpoint, from, from an investment standpoint. Um, in America, we believe that we can do anything, but some days when I sit back and I think, boy, if we had to start a nuclear submarine program from a cold start today, that is a big leap. And so, um, again, uh, I think we've, uh, to, the, to the point of your question, we've been very transparent here in terms of a deliberate approach. Among the senior uniform leaders, we have been absolutely committed uh, to a relationship that's grounded on trust. And so, we have been committed to having candid, open, uh, candid, uh, transparent, private, non-attributional discussions about risk, about being completely honest with each other in terms of how we see this uh, progressing, areas where perhaps we need to accelerate uh, where we can, but, but uh, take a deliberate approach and perhaps even slow down in areas where we think we, where we may have to raise to our uh, civilian leadership that we, could be, uh, that we could be accepting too much risk. So. Could I just add Please, one other yeah. thing to, to the Admiral? I also think we, we fully recognize that nuclear propulsion um, provides the ability to deploy for extraordinarily long periods of time uh, at greater distances and also provides the opportunity to, um, uh, to operate in an increasingly challenging environment. So the survivability that that uh, nuclear powered submarines provides, I, I would argue, is unmatched. And then the added ability to be able to deploy ordnance, um, conventional ordnance from um, great distances, has um, enormous um, game changing strategic significance in a in a variety of projected scenarios. And so, it provides survivability, flexibility much greater operational dexterity and as the admiral indicates it is a partnership that will be developed over uh, decades frankly and so this is a this is a big deal and i would say one of the strategic benefits we are already reaping um, some of the rewards we're operating um, and engaging we always worked with Australia as the closest yeah. possible partnership. But this, I think the Admiral will, will be the first to say, this is gonna elevate that. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that already. We're engaging in a way that is um, unprecedented and we will only grow from here. That's great. Uh, I, I hope the two of you don't mind if I take the prerogative as Australia chair to pretend to be Australian and therefore be really blunt. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe that's just the New Yorker in me. Uh, but if we have these great ambitions, let me stay on pillar one for a second here uh, to help grow the capabilities, mm -hmm. have a game-changing capability for the Australians. Uh, the natural question is, do we have the submarines? Uh, we know that we are mandated uh, by Congress to be producing two Virginia-class submarines per year for a variety of reasons. We're plus or minus about 1.2 uh, at the production at this point. Um, Admiral, I'd love uh, to get your comments about when we see that the initial announcement was the sale of uh, three submarines, uh, Virginia class submarines, with the potential of two more down the road. Where do those submarines come from? Uh, should those be submarines that are, we already have? Should they be future production? 
how does the kind of industrial capabilities of all three nations play into this? Because it is a numbers game at this point. It's too early uh, to give you an answer on precisely where those uh, submarines will come from, whether that's excess capacity or whether that comes out of U.S. inventory. Our goal, and you can see the testimony to it, is uh, the significant investment that the U.S. Congress is supporting in terms of the industrial base, um, $650 million uh, last year, another proposed 750 in the 24 budget, and uh, 3 point, almost 3.4 billion, I think, over the over the five-year defense plan. So a significant investment across a number of different areas: workforce development, um, uh, shipyard infrastructure, strategic outsourcing to smaller companies to take some of the pressure off the two uh, shipyards, um, uh, supply chain uh, development. Uh, another would be uh, areas like additive manufacturing, where we're trying to leverage some of the best new technological advances in manufacturing from around the world and apply it to the submarine program. So we're trying to put the industrial base in a position where they can increase their productivity, the priority still being the Columbia-class submarine uh, uh, at one a year and then, uh, and then two SSNs. So uh, we're aspirational at this point with respect to reaching the goal of two SSNs a year, but all the indicators we have right now is that we are gaining momentum in terms of closing on that. I can't give you a specific date when we expect to close on to, but we're headed in the right direction. Um, I think that puts us in a better place, or the, or the intent would be to put us in a better place uh, with uh, whatever administration might finally make the decision, with the Congress that will play in a uh, very serious kind of way in terms of laying out options. Uh, understanding the risks up front and then presenting a recommendation in terms of moving forward. But um, we are working very closely with the Congress right now. They have uh, legislation that they need to pass in order for all this to come together um, eventually. Uh, and so there are, there are we, I guess in short, um, we do not underestimate the difficulties that lie ahead. And I think it goes right to the points that we made earlier that, uh, that this, uh, the foundational trust piece here becomes really, really important. And in terms of mill-to-mill -mill relationships, you know, we're talking about a 30-year endeavor here. Uh, well, we're talking about a forever endeavor, but in terms of the phases that I spoke to, we're talking about 30 years. And, um, and so while administrations will change and uh, the, the three countries, you know, hopefully the mill-to-mill -mill relationships provide some sort of a shock absorber, right, where that you can always count on that as being uh, 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 those relationships as being uh, foundational to, to execution. Um, I'm curious on the allied piece on this because uh, at least on my quick but not so quick glance, this is a fairly unprecedented move where not only are we undertaking investments into our industrial base, our submarine industrial base here, as is the UK, as is Australia, but all three nations to a certain degree are taking investments into allies uh, industrial base too. And as far as I can tell, this is unprecedented in wartime. It's probably unprecedented in peacetime too. So I would yeah, go ahead. just on that, Charles, and I very much agree with what the Admiral said, that one of the points um, uh, of AUKUS when uh, Prime Minister Sunak, uh, Prime Minister Morrison, uh, Prime Minister, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister Albanese, President Biden met in San Diego was to underscore some of the features of, of how we're going to proceed in the next little while. We have an unprecedented commitment of Australia into our industrial base to basically focus on improving what I would argue is the jewel in the crown, um, which is our submarine uh, capacity, which frankly needs more resources and needs more focus. And they've helped, they're not only providing it, but they're helping us understand the kinds of investments that the Admiral indicates. And I would simply say, Charles, that it is not just the ability to build um, uh, two uh, submarines a year of the attack variety that, that you were describing. It is also getting um, a, uh, a, a worrisome large, worrisomely large, that doesn't make sense, a um, troublingly large number of submarines that are in dry dock or in repair to get those back into the water and deployed more quickly. 
And, and I, I think the, um, the truth is we do have a plan that will allow us to, to meet the requirements that are laid out in AUKUS. But I would also just remember that, that when submarines are provided um, from the United States to Australia, it's not like they're lost. They will be deployed by the closest possible allied force. In many cases, you could make the argument that that enhances deterrence, um, which I would, and uh, frankly creates more capacity. And that's really the reason why I'm grateful for the, reason, the way that you asked these questions. The strategic significance of AUKUS is um, that both Australia and Great Britain have made a fundamental decision to align with us strategically, not just now, but as the Admiral indicates, into the distant future. And I would say that it was not very many years ago that if you had to make an argument which countries might be prepared to reorient more closely with other countries in the region, like China, Great Britain and Australia were two countries that, you know, in 10 years ago flirted with different kinds of orientations. And that, that period has changed fundamentally. Um, on this issue of enhancing deterrence, uh, let me stick with this, because it's a, it's a delicate question, but it's also an important question, that here we have the crown jewels, as you said. Again, we're still talking about pillar one. And we're talking about whether or not you think there is a significant risk of taking these crown jewels and delivering our most important capability to a sovereign foreign, comma, very extraordinarily well-trusted ally who, depending on circumstances, may or may not be there when the balloon goes up. Um, Admiral, I'm curious how you think about that. I understand the enhancing part, but how do we wrap our heads around this? So I think we put us in a, ourselves in a position uh, with respect to mill to mill where we're ready to go um, in whatever configuration um, the political, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the governments are, are willing to go. So whether it's two or three, we have to be ready to, to be able to flex and, uh, and to adjust. So that's a, um, I'm not trying to be evasive. It's just, you know, that's what you, uh, uh, th those are directions that we would get and that we would execute um, accordingly. Can I have you underscore, because you said a second ago, uh, that having Australia have this capability has the potential to actually enhance deterrence. Can you explain why you think that's true? Well, look, the, the, the truth is, I think when you, your first question, Charles, which is about what, what steps that we're trying to right. take, I think the most important steps are to, it, to recognize that the current strategic environment is favored with the United States being able to operate engage with more and more partners. And it creates a greater sense of ballast at the strategic level and much more uncertainty with potential um, uh, provocateurs. And so I, I think that these steps are, are very strategically sound. And, and they are steady. Uh, I believe they are bipartisan. Yes, there, there may be a group of people now that talk more about just the United States acting alone. Um, but I think there is a proud tradition, it's a bipartisan tradition, that recognizes that the United States is most effective when we operate and engage with other partners with us. And no, you cannot predict every scenario in the future, but I would scarcely, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have any doubts about positing um, that the ability to operate much more effectively to create, create confidence that the United States is a stabilizing force and we want to be associated with them, that's got to be overall beneficial to the maintenance of peace and stability. So I feel quite confident that the strategic calculus favors these kinds of agreements. And, you know, I, I think that this is a major um, source of stability. Now, I do believe, Charles, one of the things that you have not raised, I think we need to do more to, there are going to be nations that have questions. 
uh, that will raise them in diplomatic fora at the IEA and elsewhere. We need, I want to commend Australia for the work they've done in the Pacific, um, the work they've done in Southeast Asia, but we need to do more. We need to constantly be on the um, informational front foot, uh, indicating that, you know, these are, that this propulsion capability will be undertaken with all the um, requirements of the IEA, IAEA and NPT fully um, uh, appreciated that this, these will not be nuclear armed, these are conventional forces, uh, conventional capabilities. And I think um, if we continue at it, we will gain more and more understanding of what we're undertaking. I will say I see that in my own deliberations. Initially at the outset, because there were uncertainties and questions that you know people would say, well, we need to know more. Uh, I'm finding more and more interlocutors, um, uh, Singapore, the Philippines, India, Japan, South Korea, uh, most of the countries of Europe fully understand the strategic circumstances and the calculus that went into this. And I'm, I'm increasingly confident that maybe not always openly and directly, but certainly behind closed doors, many, many countries understand the rationale for why we've done it, why we did it, and frankly, are uh, impressed that we did it. On the score of a uh, opening up a wider front of more nations to choose uh, that this might be in their security interests, either explicitly or implicitly. You know, we've heard ever since uh, the March 13th announcement, uh, more nations, what I would describe as pillar two curious. Uh, pillar two looks really interesting. We've heard this from New Zealand. Uh, we've heard this from South Korea. We've heard this from France uh, too. And I'd be curious as we shift a little bit uh, away from the conventionally armed nuclear powered submarines, you have to underscore those points all the time. And we look at uh, Pillar 2 uh, a little bit. What do we think uh, the prospects are for expanding Pillar 2 to cooperate with other nations? In the statements from the White House, if you're not tracking these quite as closely as we are here, uh, we have noted that there has been a call to broaden out uh, AUKUS and Pillar 2, uh, but that's about the full extent of the statements now, too. So I'd be curious to get both of your uh, take on the ability to expand this outward beyond these three nations. I think there's huge potential to do that in selected areas. Um, mm. I think that's where I would begin instead of a wholesale, you know, uh, inviting nations to Pillar 2. I would look at certain areas where uh, nations bring technology to bear that's going to make a difference and that we have high trust and confidence that we can share that information back and forth. The preponderance of, of uh, R&D, not only in the United States, but in the world is being done not by governments, but by, but by industry. And so we need to leverage that. That's the intent of Pillar 2, yeah. is to leverage that and to hit the accelerator so that uh, DOD, at least I'll, I'll speak for just uh, the United States, DOD is sometimes very slow. Uh, in terms of how we transition new technology uh, to actually fielding it. Uh, and so we're trying to use, in some ways, Pillar 2 to accelerate that significantly so we can take disruptive technologies in some of those areas that I mentioned before and to, uh, and to get them on the table. I, I, don't think the, I don't think I could say it any better than the Admiral has. I thought it was extremely well articulated. I do believe that there are, are going to be some areas where allies and partners, some allies and partners have some either direct or niche areas where they can assist in a larger endeavor. And that might be in hypersonics, that could be in cybersecurity, it could be in anti-submarine warfare. There are a number of um, areas that we will explore as we go forward. I think the key is going to be that, that you know, what do you bring to the table? And are you able to do it in such a way that is, that's going to be uh, practical and operational? So we're not just looking for theoretical um, uh, applications and partnerships, but practical, real um, uh, uh, efforts that will enhance defense capabilities. And so, yes, we are, I, I will say, Charles, I'm not, we, we, we are in conversation with a variety of countries um, who are interested. And frankly, it goes far beyond just those countries. Yeah. And 
we're, we're grateful for that. The fact that countries are interested in it um, uh, is, is a positive, and we will, uh, we will explore those appropriately. I think all three countries have made clear that under the appropriate circumstances, we would be um, uh, prepared to work um, collaboratively um, with other partners who bring uh, capacity to the challenge. Not a club to join. Uh, but something for those nations who have resources and capabilities to actually go after this. Yeah, and, and I think that's going to be important. You, you're going to have to make the argument about what we bring to th this is This is not just what you receive, but what you bring. Gotcha. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions. And in the press, there are a lot of questions. I've yeah. got a, a lot of questions online, too, about uh, some of the challenges that we have, Admiral, you already started to talk about this, about how we share uh, technology, mm -hmm. how we can collaborate, how we can actually get money into our system uh, mm -hmm. from others. And mm -hmm. so this begins to dive down into the weeds of uh, you know, technology transfer, export control, ITAR uh, reform. Mm -hmm. Just gonna, this is, I got this question. It's emblematic of a lot of questions we're gonna get. This is from uh, Eli Cook at the Cohen Group. Uh, AUKUS marks a major enhancement of U.S.-Australian defense cooperation. Uh, while progress has been made towards the agreement's goals, many commentators, I guess he's including himself here, note existing U.S. export controls like ITAR have proved complicated and inhibiting given the apparent urgency of the situation. Uh, his question, but I think a lot of people's question are, do you agree with that assessment? If so, what progress is being made on this front to break down some of those barriers? Because given the urgency of the challenge that both of you have described and some of the slowness of our system reimagining what it might look like, curious uh, your two cents about what we look like in terms of reforming the system at this point. Well, first and foremost, I think leveraging um, a pres this is a presidential initiative. And so leveraging that to begin with helps break down barriers. I think that you need to understand what those barriers are to technology transfer in each individual case. And I think they need to be raised, discussed. The risk needs to be uh, clearly understood. And then we look at how do we mitigate and break down those, those barriers. There are technologies that exist today, uh, like Zero Trust as an example, that we can leverage in these technology transfer frameworks uh, that perhaps, um, well, not perhaps, but uh, that would definitely uh, mitigate or drive down risk and perhaps answer a lot of questions or mitigate um, apprehension that some might have. Uh, we are in, we are in uh, conversations with the Congress right now about AUKUS and the legislative proposals that are required in order to uh, in order to move forward. And some of those involve the very things that uh, you mentioned. And the Admiral has given a really good answer. I, I would just begin with where he began, Charles, which is um, uh, this is this has been mandated by the President. So this is not a weather to. It's a how-to, and, and I just think sometimes that simple, crystallized uh, fact helps quite a lot in complex bureaucratic situations, right? So we're under clear instructions to move in that direction. I would make that yeah. point number one. Number two, I also think we recognize that we're moving into an environment where we need to mo work more um, effectively with allies and partners. And that begins with working more effectively with our closest allies and partners. And this is a classic, critical, early case study of taking the necessary steps to make sure that you're working in a way with Australia and Great Britain that, that we won't point to inhibitions of, as being uh, things that have made this uh, ambitious program um, uh, moving slower than it should be, right? So I, I, I think we fully recognize that's the second point I would make. And the third is that, as the Admiral indicated, we are in the midst of very substantial discussions, both internally inside the government but with Congress about how to take those steps. And so I, I, you know, yes, there is substantial debate um, that is ongoing about, you know, whether this process um, 
uh, will be fulfilled. I would simply say everything I've seen signals that the U.S. government, the Australian government, are taking this just as seriously as possible and that we are seeking to address exactly the points that you've laid out for us, Charles. Right. And this is extraordinarily challenging because we're figuring out for the first time in 40 plus years how we're going to collaborate and safeguard and tighten those safeguard of controls between all three of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess on that uh, final question for me, then I'll make sure that we hit uh, the audience too. Uh, but uh, Admiral, you talked about this a bit, uh, about the fact that we're moving into the world of nuclear stewardship uh, in a way that we are sharing, uh, in a sense that we haven't undertaken since we did it with the Brits multiple uh, decades ago. So as Australia, starts this up from zero, mm -hmm. as you said, right? That it's a question about whether or not we would have done, wanted to do it mm -hmm. from zero. Mm -hmm. uh, when we think about the lessons of nuclear stewardship, um, what are things that we need to think about managing? Uh, I mean, that's, that's an enormously large question, but from the diplomatic, political, legal area, what are some of the challenges that we have to get ahead of when we think about protecting and safeguarding this uh, technology? You know, um, at one point, as we we're as we we're talking about AUKUS uh, w between heads of Navy, um, I pulled out and I reviewed Admiral Rickover's comments in 1979 yeah. after the Three Mile Island uh, disaster, and he talked about the core principles that we have established in the Navy nuclear propulsion uh, community that we have never wavered from to this day. They, you know, down to every everybody that serves on on a nuclear powered vessel understands those tenants that Rick laid down in the 1950s. And so he talked about he he panned the difference between uh, the civilian nuclear community and, uh, and and the Navy and the fact that that, you know, the Navy's requirements uh, are more rigorous just based on the operating environment, yeah. but staying true to them uh, and holding each other accountable. Um, in, in, in that type of environment becomes very, very important and I think uh, can keep you out of trouble. And so um, I won't speak to the, to the big, you know, the, the, the policy issues, but I'll just say at the end of the day, um, as I said earlier, the bumper sticker is there are no shortcuts. Um, we need to stay focused, uh, our navies, in terms of what we're going to do and, and that we're going to do it together safely. Yeah. Can I just trace on that? Just so I, like the Admiral, I, like one of the great things about about the Navy and, and is is that its um, leadership encourages using history as a guide um, to help think through this period. And the fact is that no, we're not starting from scratch. We have um, uh, almost 80 years of experience, and so the Australians have an enormous. Um, backlog, legacy, and foundational support from the United States around best practices. And I just, I just don't think you can underestimate the importance of that, number one. And when you look at the challenges, the focus primarily, and which is, which is uh, to be expected, has been on costs and around other issues associated with a nuclear program. But the real challenge is creating the cadre of highly skilled, motivated individuals who are going to be to prepared to work both in industry and on board ship and uh, submarine, sorry. Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell you, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that that process has already started substantially and the, the naval officers and enlisted that are serving from Australian uh, forces in American schools are doing extraordinarily well. And we're going to build on that, and it will be done in Great Britain as well. And so, so I, I do think it's important to remember, Charles, this is not starting from scratch. Um, we, we have decided, and I've watched this, and I've watched the brotherhood and the partnership that the Navy has brought to this. Yes, at the outset, some skepticism, some uncertainty, appropriately so. But I've watched them make the internal commitment that they're going to do what they can to help Australia, as Great Britain will, to mount this enormous challenge. 
And because we've done it and we know how to do it, we have high confidence that we can help them along this path. And so I don't, I, yes, it's enormously challenging, but we have an enormous amount of capacity to convey and to and knowledge and experience that will come in handy, that, that not just come in handy, that will be irreplaceable and the, the best indicator of success. But also, may I have yeah, just please. one point, uh, Dr. Campbell? Thank you um, for, those, for those okay. for those comments. Um, uh, I, we graduate our first group of Australian submariners from our nuclear power school in Charleston in just over a week's time. So we're very proud of that. And, and they're they all are, they're all above the mean. They, they are doing very well. I mean, <laughs> but all of them are yeah. above the mean. Not just a couple of them, right? These are not these are these are guys that are excelling. And, and we're, we're gonna double down on this, and that commitment is powerful and, and, and impressive. And so, so, like, you know, when you look at the challenges, Char Charles, will this be sustained politically? I have every indication uh, that it will be sustained politically in the United States and Australia. I just, I believe, for the reasons that the Admiral, like, the, the ballast in our boat will be the armed forces, will be the Navy, will be um, our, uh, commitment of our defense establishments to now that we've started, we must complete. I also believe that politically, after extensive discussion between Republicans and Democrats here, both parties uh, you know, others in Australia, that we have the necessary understanding about what's involved here. Um, and and uh, look, I, I do believe that there will be challenges ahead, but at the same time, I think people accept those. And we didn't dawdle and do nothing with that 18 month period. We, we essentially explored and interrogated all of these problems together. And we were extremely direct about what this was gonna need, the numbers of people that are gonna need to be trained. And yes, there is a tendency to say, oh my gosh, are people really aware of what's gonna be necessary? I, I don't think that it's possible with an endeavor of this magnitude to be able to identify everything, but I've rarely seen a process more significant, more attuned to the challenges, as opposed to just thinking about the parade when we're yeah. celebrating the victory, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, 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 I'm quite confident and bullish that our three uh, uh, countries, our capacities are up to this challenge. I just note uh, one of the byproducts, outproducts, just a product of that intensive 18-month endeavor, particularly when we're dealing with the international community that has questions about this, as you were outlining, is uh, here at CSIS, uh, we hosted Raphael Grossi, the head of the IAEA, who said mm -hmm. that this was undertaken uh, as an unprecedented step in the most transparent fashion possible and has a clean bill of health from the IAEA to this point. Right? So any other information that's out there is not tracking with where IAEA is at that. I know that that was a first goal. And, and you initiative. cannot have a country that is in better standing at the IAEA and the NPT than Australia has. Right. And so I completely yeah. agree with that. I think if anything, I think we probably have to do a better job of promulgating yeah. um, uh, this storyline, and we will. Got it. All right, uh, that's enough uh, from us here. Uh, I, I know lots of questions. Uh, Will Malden, I saw your hand go up, so please stand up, identify yourself, and ask a succinct question. Thanks, Charlie, uh, or Charles, I guess I should say. Um, yeah, Will Malden with the Wall Street Journal, and uh, uh, all these uh, submarines and allies in the region got me thinking about the potential for uh, incidents or unexpected uh, events with, with China or other nations. And uh, for those of us in um, Beijing last week, with uh, Secretary of State Blinken, we were um, we, we found out that there was not a breakthrough in terms of getting a military-to-military -military channel going to work with China. So I'm wondering, um, is it worth is it worth loosening sanctions on the Chinese Defense Minister to get some kind of a military-to-military -military, um, channel going, or you know, how would that help, or, or what do you do in terms of incident? Thank you. I can start. That's part policy of that. question. Yeah. So thank you. So look, um, China's inhibitions around uh, military to military uh, 
uh, crisis prevention mechanisms and communication capabilities are longstanding. They're, this is not a recent um, phenomenon. Um, and we do believe that it is important for the United States and China to take the necessary uh, practical steps that would enable um, uh, effective communication to deal with an unintended uh, 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 set of circumstances or an accident or a mishap. And we will continue to ar articulate the rationale for why these are important, particularly as our forces increasingly rub up against one another, operate in closer proximity. I will simply say that if you, and you do, it's been reported in the Wall Street Journal, China has undertaken some of these steps with other countries in Southeast Asia. I think they recognize the value of them, but for a variety of reasons. And we would say that they are, um, they extend beyond simply um, uh, restrictions placed on senior officers. Uh, the Chinese have been reluctant historically to undertake these efforts. Um, we are going to continue to make the case, both as Secretary Austin did at Shangri-La, and we try to do in all of our undertakings that it is um, uh, necessary, uh, prudent, uh, and uh, indeed uh, expected that the United States and China take the necessary steps to have those lines of communication to deal with unexpected circumstances like a spy balloon that makes its way across the United States, which no one had anticipated, but, um, but uh, in fact, the necessary mill-to-mill -mill communications were lacking in that set of circumstances. And so I think, um, uh, I think uh, we will continue to make the arguments about why uh, these are necessary, and we believe that the diplomacy that you experienced last week with uh, Secretary Blinken and the Chinese leadership is a good step, and we will continue to take those uh, steps to improve dialogue and discussion with China as part of our larger uh, strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Okay. So from, the, from, from an operator standpoint, uh, operating in international airspace and on the seas, we follow the internationally recognized rules. And uh, as you all have seen from, uh, from videos that we've released uh, when we've been in close contact with, whether it's the Russians or the Chinese, we have been, our, our commanding officers out there uh, have been very clear and unambiguous in terms of communicating very directly to their counterparts and other ships and aircraft what our intentions are, how we're maneuvering, uh, what we're going to do next uh, in accordance with international law to avoid any kind of provocations. It is really important that we remain unemotional with a high degree of professionalism in terms of how we operate, as you would expect we would. Washington time, let me take maybe uh, two questions here at once. Uh, Peter and then Annalise, please. Yeah, thanks very much. Peter Hi, Martin. Peter. From, uh, from Bloomberg News. Uh, a question for both of you. I guess that you know there's a disparate set of technologies listed in Pillar 2, but I think a lot of people, including me, are still, still find the whole, the whole pillar a little bit theoretical. So if you could talk through what some of those technologies will actually mean for deterrence. Um, and then I would be professionally negligent if I didn't ask Kurt what the events of the last 72 hours mean for Xi Jinping's big bet on Vladimir Putin. Thank you. Right. So that's two. We're going to add a third question on top of it. That means you get to choose which ones you answer, too. <laughs> Annalise? There's the microphone. Hi. Annalise Nielsen from Sky News Australia. Uh, Mr. Campbell, from the Australian perspective, we're very strategically aligned with the U.S. now, with AUKUS. We're still suffering from some serious economic coercion from China in the meantime. And uh, quite specifically, I'm thinking of the case of my former colleague, Chung Mei, who's been detained in China for two years. No progress in her case as yet. What is the US doing to support her case and also Australia dealing with Chinese coercion? And the Admiral, uh, also similar vein, we're uh, on board with AUKUS now, but Australia is quite strategically vulnerable until these submarines come online. What's happening in the meantime to assure, ensure that Australia is not left vulnerable? 
All right, those are four questions. Uh, pick your poison. I'll start, I'll start and let the, some of these, I don't want, and you know, I'll have to venture into unfair ground, but he'll, he'll figure out the ones that are the right ones for him. So, <laughs> so look, I would say that, um, that uh, when our senior uh, diplomats engage uh, uh, with Chinese interlocutors, we do raise cases uh, of uh, uh, generally citizens and others that are, we believe, being arbitrarily um, or uh, inappropriately held in China. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details, and I will also say that we coordinate with Australia as well. So I'll just I'll begin with that on the issue of um, uh, on the issue of of uh, economic coercion. Um, I, I think you will have seen some of the statements that came out of the G7. Unprecedented recognition among allied democracies about the challenge that this poses and the need to take collective steps. And I think so there is a deeper recognition that what, what Australia has experienced and frankly um, handled with greater effectiveness than probably any country on the planet. But those activities of economic um, uh, uh, punishment that have been perpetrated against Australia We've seen it against Europe in various circumstances, the Philippines, South Korea. Um, I think we recognize the challenge that this presents um, uh, to uh, both national economies but the global economy. And I think we've sought to undertake a broader effort, not only as part of our direct diplomacy but working with other countries to gather uh, uh, capacity in, in which to address uh, uh, these issues uh, directly with Chinese interlocutors. Um, and it is a, a significant and serious continuing issue uh, on the global stage. To Peter's good questions about, um, uh, Peter, your, your first question, can you remind me just real quickly? I'm sorry. How would the Yeah, so look, I, uh, you, so, uh, uh, I, I would say that, that the lion's share of what we've focused on to date has been to ensure that pillar one, that the foundational understandings, capabilities, legal requirements, and that, 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 um, that that foundation is um, essentially ready for liftoff. And that's been our dominant uh, focus. I think I would argue appropriately. We also believe that, and we have begun efforts associated with Pillar 2. Part of what we are doing is doing a kind of um, cataloging with various countries of uh, areas where we've seen particular progress, particular areas of, uh, of technological capacity that we might seek to uh, build upon. I think I did identify some of the areas that I think have been candidate topics. Those are by no means meant to be exclusive. We are exploring other opportunities as well. Peter, I think what I would simply say is kind of watch this space. Um, we are in substantial discussions now associated with Pillar 2 at the same time that we're trying to make sure that the, again, the foundational steps are in, um, in good shape with respect to launching Pillar 1 uh, effectively. And now I've forgotten your second question. This is bad. I'm sorry. Yeah. So look, I, I think it would be fair to say that um, uh, recent developments in Russia uh, have been unsettling uh, to the Chinese leadership. And um, uh, I think I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Admiral. In terms of uh, Pillar 2, most of the things that we're working on right now with both the UK and Australia are classified. But I would, uh, I would say that uh, examples that I, can, that I can speak about involve AI and unmanned, in which are closely linked. The the uh, the AI being the uh, being the plug on top of the on you know to the to the to the water bottle which would be the platform, 
Um, and so we're doing work in the Middle East. We're about to do more in, uh, in South America. And we'll join both the, the uh, Australians and, and the Brits for a big uh, unmanned exercise that the Australians are going to host in the fall. With respect to uh, deterrence, we are about in July. We will um, commission the USS Canberra in Sydney, the first U.S. ship to be commissioned in a foreign country. And so, one example of us stepping forward a little bit, uh, perhaps. Uh, that has some deterrent value. We don't do that very often, and so uh, well, this will be the first time. Um, I think the partnership is alive and well, and we're trying not to self-limit with respect to what we're going to do together in the future. Um, again, uh, for those of you who don't obsessively cover every twist and turn on AUKUS, I would refer you to some of uh, the uh, pubs, even the social media that uh, the Department of Defense has put out specifically around AI and unmanned systems, and specifically around efforts that have under, been undertaken in the UK over the last month, uh, Peter. Um, I would just like to say, uh, before we wrap, uh, I would really like to underscore the unprecedented nature of the endeavor uh, that we are on. Uh, we are hinting our way, we are peeking our way towards a new way of trusting our allies here to strengthen them in order to strengthen ourselves. That is something that we haven't done in at least 70 years time, if not more than that. I'd really like to thank both of you, not only for taking the time, but for the extraordinary efforts that you've put into this and putting the way forward for actually making sure that we have that stability that we need. If everyone could join me, please. Could, could I say one last thing on the way out, Charles? No, I mean there. no you can't, can yes, I, please. Can I just also say for you guys, uh, Admiral Gilday is coming to the yes. uh, end of an incredible period of, of leadership of the Navy, uh, a life of service and commitment. Um, and the last couple of years have been some of the most challenging. And so the person who deserves so much credit for making sure that you know we're asking the right questions, that we're attacking the problem effectively is Admiral Gilday. And so as we're wrapping up today, I, I'm gonna do my clapping for him. Thank you. Sure, thank you.